Greetings everyone, welcome to the Out of View where reason comes first. My name is Professor Les Henry and today it is an absolute delight to welcome my colleague, my sister, in, my friend Dr. Maria Del Pilar Caladine. Is that right? Have I said your name? Yeah, yeah that's right. I've got a triple barreled first name. Okay. So my <laughs> sister Maria, tell us a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself to whoever may be watching the hour. Uh, Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I, um, I am a scholar of indenture, so I'm an academic working on the system of indenture, and I focus specifically on indenture in the Caribbean. And um, I look at this system, which operated in the Caribbean between 1838 and 1917, that brought Indians to work on sugar plantations um, in Guyana, in Trinidad, and in smaller numbers in Jamaica, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, mm. um, St. Vincent, and um, that's, that's my work. And I, I think perhaps the most important thing to know about me is that my work was generated a lot by my parents' silence about their roots. So I don't think that was a deliberate thing that they did not to talk about their heritage. Um, but in my dad's case, it's my dad who is a descendant of Indian indentured laborers. I think it was kind of an attempt to protect us yeah. Um, just, I think this idea that he would shroud his kids in Britishness, yeah, and uh, we would be kind of we would be shielded from, uh, you know, from what was then. I mean, my my oldest brother was born in 1965. I was born 10 years later. What was then a really hostile environment. Yeah. Um, and I think it's that it's everything that he didn't say um, about who he was, where he came from where his grandparents, great-grandparents came from, that has determined my work. Okay. As a, yeah, as an academic. Okay, well, I think, for me, that's a good place to start because, you know, I've said this to you before, that if I go to 100 conferences on the Caribbean, only yeah. two will deal with indentureship in the Caribbean. It's almost like it's an appendage or a footnote in that history yeah, as yeah. you say, and just some of the islands that you mentioned, we know it was a central factor because those those people, those indentured workers, were also used as a buffer, in some ways, between the you know the white masters ruling class and the African enslaved. So I know one of the things that you're interested in, not that your interest, one of the things that is central to your work, and you've kind of alluded to it when you're speaking about the case of your father, and that mm -hmm. is you need to make these people visible. They had yeah. histories, they brought cultures with them, they brought knowledges with them, and those things have been integrated into the, the Caribbean, more so I would say Trinidad and Guyana, which I've, uh, um, ironically I've never been to those two places. But you know, a lot of my brethren and sister and brothers and sisters are from those places. So, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about not only why it's central to what you do, but some examples of how you make those invisibilities visible. Well, yeah, I think, um, so, so I've, I've just in the last, so it was the centenary of the abolition. When I say abolition, um, I mean, that, that wasn't a total abolition of indenture by, by any stretch, but um, the formal date that we use of 2017, or um, being the centenary, of the abolition of indentured labor there was a lot of activity there was a lot of really interesting work going on around that time and so one thing that has been incredible for me as a um as a scholar that focusing on indenture in the caribbean was an opportunity to um to be part of editing an anthology that compiled the work of descendants of indentured laborers yeah. from across the indentured labor diaspora so that was beyond the Caribbean to South Africa, Mauritius, Fiji, Malaysia, Sri Lanka. And I mean, that is, from that, I think there, there is a, you know, there is a general feeling amongst my colleagues, um, descendants of indentured laborers working in this field, that there are so many important connections yeah. to, uh, um, to make between you know between these groups but this idea of an indentured labor diaspora is something that i'm really i'm really interested in exploring more um yeah well that's one of the things that i know i've definitely got from your work and again 
you know, people who are watching this probably have never made those connections because I know I didn't really make them until, you know, I saw you do your presentation when we met at Senate House and I believe, was that 2017 or 2016? Possibly, possibly, because I know, I know we, we met also, or we re-met at a Walter Rodney conference. Do you remember it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I did, yeah. 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 But Which, I know it, was, it yeah. was definitely at the SOAS one where, you know, our wonderful sister, Prof Tina, Man, um, yeah. Prof Tina Ramnarain was yeah. there. And I remember you were making those links then. And for yeah. me, is that notion of, because I suppose it's a bit, like how we would talk about African colonization. So it's, that's the easy one in this sense, because we know people were taken from the continent, they were scattered across the Americas. So in some ways it's easier to kind of make those links. But when you think about under the framework of indentureship, especially yeah. under the British empire, yeah. or, you know, the connections with the Raj, we wouldn't yeah. necessarily think about that. So, you know, yeah. can you give us a little bit more yeah, Liz, you know, this is this is something that's so interesting to me is this idea that people hear Indian names um, associated with the Caribbean, but they don't make that connection. So Chandrapur, for example, the, yeah. the cricketer. Yeah. Um, oftentimes when I'm traveling um, and I'll say people, people will ask somebody who looks like me where I'm from all the time. Yeah. Um, and you know they. Um, th so that happens when I'm traveling, and I'll say, "Oh, my, you know, my dad's from uh, my dad's from Guyana," and uh, they'll say, uh, "They'll say Guyana, Guyana." They can't quite place it, and then I'll, you know, I'll say, "I'll, you know, I'll tell them geographically where Guyana is." And if we're in a little bit of trouble, I may say, "Oh, do you know the cricket? Do you like the cricket?" They like the cricket. I will always reference Chandra Paul, and I say, "Yeah." So his his great grandparents were. Um, were Indian, like my my dad's parents, and then people sort people have this thing where they sort of know, they sort of understand that there are Indian people in other parts of the world, but they don't quite understand how they got there. Yes, um, and it is the same system. It's the same. It's only happened to me once that um, I said my dad was. I was in Mauritius, and I said um, I said, "Oh, my dad's from Guyana," because a guy had seen my books. I was doing my PhD at the time. Okay. And uh, the guy had seen my books. Um, he'd come in to um, to fix a shower, and he see my books. And he said, "Oh, we." Um, he said, "You're from Guyana," and I said, "I said my dad's from Guyana." And he said, "Oh, we're the same people." And uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a it was a lovely gentleman. He took my husband and I to um, to his village. We stayed in a hotel, meet his mum, and um, and have a chat with a bit. Yeah, but it was it, it was. So, I was saying to my husband, "How often does that happen?" Because he watches me all the time, kind of do this thing where I say, "Oh, you know, my dad's from Guyana, but his grandparents are Indian." Yeah. It's, you know, and it, it's that, uh, it's nice to have that shorthand. I've got to say in work, Les, it's lovely to have that shorthand when you're working with people um, who are descendants of indentured labourers to not have to do all this explaining. Yes. You know course. what I mean? Where you're yeah. from, where you, you know, it's, it's yeah. lovely. It's lovely just to be able to just dive into it and, uh, and, and enjoy the fruits of your labour. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's it's a sad thing. It's kind of uh, I think one of the questions we were asking in the centenary was what would it take? Um, what would it take for for there to be a wider knowledge in Britain about the system of indenture and what the results um, yeah. of scattering so many people across the globe? Yeah. Um, what what were they? Um, yeah. There's a really moving, but there's a documentary the BBC did I think 2001. Um, and it would never get passed with this title now, but it was called Coolies, How Britain uh, Reinvented the Slave Trade. And there's a really moving scene where Bridge Lau, who's, a, um, who's studied, dedicated his, his, entire, um, his entire adult life to the study of indenture, and he's sitting by the sea and he says, you know, people see Indians kind of scattered all over the globe, but do they ever stop to think about how we got where we are? And I don't think they do. No, I, I, agree, I totally agree with you. Yeah. I disagree because as I said you know I was quite fortunate because I met um, Prof Tina Ramnaran I think it was in around 98 and she actually invited me to give a talk in the University of uh, Belfast when she was in Belfast teaching anthropology and you know the wonderful stuff she does about ethnomusicology and stuff yeah so I've, I've been privileged to reason with people like Tina Ramnaran and you know a guy called Professor Kimani Nahusi who's right. also from Guyana 
So yeah. I was quite privileged because they've introduced me to that. And in fact, I've got an anthology called I Come Back Home, which was okay. um, edited by Kimani Nahusi and Prof Ian Isidore Smart, who created some yeah. of this fan of fun studies. He's from Trinidad. So I was quite privileged in the fact that I've got these first hand accounts of that. Mm -hmm. But if you, as I said, if you go to general so called West Indian stroke Caribbean spaces, you're invisible. We know you're there. So if you mm -hmm. go to Jamaica and you say, you know, where do people like Supercat live in Kingston, Cockburn Pen? That's where they live. Yeah. But people will never question how did they get there? Or people won't mm -hmm. say, how did they get there? And yeah. especially when you're in places like Jamaica and other islands I've been in the Caribbean, they're not even questions that the local people will ask. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I think if you talk about the Chinese diaspora, it's kind of different. Mm -hmm. sure. sure, Because where they came in was for a different kind of role during a different period. Because with the indentureship, you know, I always say to people, for me, it was almost like that, that bridge between the end of so-called chattel enslavement or the end of chattel enslavement and that morphing into indentureship and where it blurs the distinctions with apprenticeship as right. well. Yeah. Because I know a lot of people have got confused and thought that indentureship was apprenticeship. And I'm saying to them, no, they, com they were completely different things. I know one thing I wanted to ask you, I remember when I was studying um, anthropology with the wonderful Professor Jean Besson at Goldsmiths College, and she, if my mind serves me correctly, when she was saying to us, some of the strategies that they used to kind of hold the indentured, you know, Indians who were taken from the continent to, you know, the Americas, let's call it, because as you've mentioned, it's not just the Caribbean, these, these things are hidden in other places. But one of the things that she said was they would give them this thing similar to what the Australians did called the language test. So they might say, OK, your indentureship is for four years. If you want to go home, you have to fill out this or complete this test to prove who you are or whatever. And it will right. be in a language that they know you don't speak. Yeah. So I don't know if you heard of anything about that. Was she speak? That's interesting to me. Was she speaking specifically about I, I know her. She's a I mean, I mean, she's a fabulous scholar was she speaking specifically about jamaica or no i think she was board, speaking no. about no i think she was speaking about where we tri, um trinidad yeah. guyana places like that because her course was Ar um, caribbean anthropology right. so we went across the islands yeah 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 i you know what i do know and um, i mean just kind of uh, this is this in itself is is really interesting there were people there were people in the community who would write and fill out forms for others. That's right, yeah. And to me, where this, like, you know, where this kind of, um, where this kind of gets quite exciting is whenever there was a commission of inquiry, they would say, uh, oh, okay, well, you know, you can send in a written complaint and uh, it, it will be yeah. considered. Yeah, right? yeah. So um, that's, um, I think, some of the letters that went to, some of the letters that went to those um, complaints, or, or sorry, that went to the commissions, um, I don't think they didn't, I don't think they collected them all, I don't think they represented them all, but you do see, you do sometimes come across them in the archives. Yeah. Um, and they are kind of like, you know, going back to this, this idea of, um, of invisibility, these moments in the archive um, where, where we find documents that were written by or were dictated by um, Indian indentured labourers or their descendants mm. are really are really fascinating yeah. um, because it's this idea we know about physical resistance we know about yeah. um, we know about um, uprisings on estates but this idea kind of of of, um, of using the language of the coloniser to destable the system of indenture. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is really um, is really intriguing and very important. And those moments where you come across those documents are so few and far between. And I kind of um, uh, I love uh, I love those, particularly looking at newspapers, which I did a lot during my um, when I was writing my PhD. I love those moments where you get this, you know, you you 
you see this person kind of come alive to you. So we have this image of, in our head of um, indentured, me particularly because I, I collect antique postcards, photos of indentured um, Indian labourers who 99% were taken by, um, by the British to, as colonial propaganda for the system of indenture. Um, but you have this idea in your mind of an Indian indentured labourer and it's, um, it, it's these moments when their, their words are staring back at you on the page, you've written a letter to newspapers, complain about an aspect of the system, that, you know, those are, those moments are golden to me, yeah. where the invisible become, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, and, the, and the thing is, you know, again, it's the fact that there, there is a viable historical presence but as usual especially under this system of colonialism or imperialism or whatever it is we have to ex ex we have to excavate those histories yes you know yes, that's one do. of the things yeah. that i know you do in your work because i remember yeah. actually learning that that they would get people to write letters for them you know they would get people to dictate yeah. letters for them because you know obviously a lot of them didn't speak english and why would they yeah, it's um, you know I think what, one of the one of the most powerful things about contemporary literature by descendants of indentured labourers is this idea that they have um, that they are connecting themselves with writers are connecting themselves with their indentured past and what grasping onto these fragments that we know um from so you i mean there are quite a few writers of fiction um of, of guyanese heritage who have actually been into the archive um and in addition to that used oral history um to write their novels and i think that that is something you know to as a counter to this idea of invisibility which is really yeah. important so the history that we know it comes to us um, or the history that we know as um, as academics going into an archive is filtered through colonialism. The people who the people who were indentured labourers were never assigned the value. They were never assigned the value of the products that they were brought to make. Yes. and that is reflected yeah. in every in every single document that you you come across in um, that is authored by um, a colonial bureaucrat. Yeah. So we, you know, we have to push back beyond the archive. The archive is not a place where that we can trust. No. Um, and we have to kind of keep pushing, pushing, pushing and seeing what, you know, what else is there? Um, you know, what lies beyond here? Um, in what other ways can we see and represent our history? What other resources do we have? Yeah. And what are we doing now to make sure that the 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 people who knew their Indian grandparents. So my dad, um, Les, is still alive. He's eighty two. I would give that. Um, yeah, and um, and I talk I talk to him a lot about his Indian grandparents. He remembers them kind of grow. He grew up with them, and um, I I think that 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 to, to keep talking about to him about it, to keep recording his stories, is a way of preserving this past. Absolutely, um, yeah. And it's so important. It's so I think some of the some of the finest works of literature, certainly the ones that I write about, um, they have been produced by authors, Guyanese writers, who are interested in kind of. There's a lovely novel I must tell you about called Henry's Cure, um, which is written by a Guyanese author Moses Nagamutu. Okay. And um, I, I love this idea of representations of stories of people who are minorities within minorities. And in Indian indenture in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. um, people who were Muslim and Indian and people who were South Indian were minor. They were both minority groups in the Caribbean. So I don't know if you've ever heard in in uh, in India, this word has different. It has different connotations. Um, but in the Caribbean, people will talk about somebody being a Madrasi, somebody being from um, from South Indian, from the South Indian community. And Moses Nagamutu self-identifies as a Madrasi, a, South, a person of South Indian heritage. And his community um, were very, very interesting in that they really resisted this idea of being tied to a plantation. And many of them, when they completed the period of indenture, moved off um, and took up job, jobs in um, fishing, for example. Okay. And stuff, jobs where they would where they, where they were tied to tide, the timing of the tide rather than. Oh, beautiful! Um, That's such a uh, beautiful um, 
what do we call that analogy metaphor i don't know that is beautiful tied to the tide yeah well, i might have yeah. to nick that it's a it's it's a i mean it's a it's a fabulous fabulous book and it it um i've been looking at it recently because i've been writing about it and i love i love the way that he takes so um you'll know that um that for a long time <laughs> guyana would be referred to as book as guyana instead of british guyana because of course yeah. book has owned all the the sugar plantations and i love oh, is that where that came from yeah. Because I heard yeah. of that before. Yeah. But I didn't know it was actually linked to physical people. Yeah. Yeah. They, I was talking to my dad's first cousin, my uncle, who's also in his 80s the other day, and I was saying I was saying something about how Booker's owned it. He said they didn't just own the sugar blood. He said they owned everything. It really was Booker's Guyana. They owned absolutely everything. Yeah. And um, I love the way he takes... Uh, he manages to take, but so this this book is set in the 40s and the 50s, and he manages to take colonialism. He manages to take um, Booker's and Britain and just pelt them into the margins of this novel, okay. um, where they kind of exist as this, you know, as this sort of awful corrupt. He he refers to them at one point as a vampire, the you know kind of like the the colonial vampire. He calls Booker's the colonial vampire, um, and when somebody dies in the village. They will say, um, "Booker's done with he, Booker's sucky dry," and uh, <laughs> um, I'm deliberately not doing the, the the Guyanese accent because I don't want to be disrespectful. Um, but I love that. Listen, um, they always call me Jafaka, and I don't care <laughs> because to me, it it is what it is. It comes out, yeah. and it comes out, you know. Yeah. I, and I, I love that. Um, I, I love that idea that um, you know this. Uh, just the. A book as a piece of a piece of resistance. It was a great way of him taking his childhood because he himself says this is a, this is kind of like a blend of fact and fiction, um, and giving it to us um, the the lives, experiences of the people in this village. Yeah. Um, and um, I kind of uh, it's it's that um, it's the entire opposite of what I was talking about happening in the colonial archive, where we have everything filtered through this. It's actually saying you know this is our story and we're going to put the voices of the um of the people who colonized us in the margins of this story yeah. this is kind of embodied for me in this magnificent chapter where um so i work on a, a, a something i call indenture to windrush so i'm very interested in the experiences yeah. of people like my dad yeah. Yeah. who were um who were descendants of indentured laborers who came here as windrush migrants and what was that like you know um when people didn't know about the British people don't know about the system of indenture. Your average British person doesn't know about uh, the system no. of indenture. Um, and what was that like for him, you know, as a, as a man who looked Indian, um, who was very obviously Guyanese, um, in, and how did, he experience, how did he experience life? And I'm, I kind of, so this is the subject of an anthology that I'm working on with Tina Ramarine as well. Okay, wow. Um, it's called The Other Windrush. So, but one of, um, in one of the chapters, he does something which I find so, so clever and so funny, which is that he sends one of his characters. I don't know if this is true or not. I can ask, I can ask, um, I, I should email him and ask him because he's a very approachable writer. Okay. Um, he sends one of his characters to London and the guy is so depressed and, and sad. And he's like, London is a dog shit city. Um, he said, everywhere you go, there's a, which, I mean, I mean, I was born in 75 and there was dog poop, like there was a huge walk into school, there was dog poo everywhere. And I just can't get back. on that because where I live, that is my yeah. hate. Yeah. You know, we often go for walks and it's just disgusting. Yeah. But yeah. the irony is, and I say this to people, and again, you know, you're there to, to prove me right or wrong. You don't see that in the Caribbean. <sighs> You know what? I, I kind of um, this is so. This is the point. So he's talking about he's talking about the dog shits and the pigeon shits and and um, it's this idea that that colonial propaganda was so invested in telling everyone, you know, where we come from is obviously so much better than this this place, this Guyana, this Georgetown. You know, if only you, you know. And and then this guy goes over and he's like, "What the hell? You know, yeah. what the hell? This is I've all." Got to read that. I, it's a, it's, it is a brutally funny book. It is so funny. Yeah, and um, yeah. uh, I, lo I love these writers that, um, you know, that are, are invested in um, kind of uh, g 
giving us giving us history, giving us a story, but also giving us history. Because I think this is one of the ways we're looking at this archive, um, which we know has is like full of bullet holes uh, from the perspective of our of our history. Um, where you know where else can we go? We can go to literature. We can go to poetry. There are other you know there are other places. There's yeah. a project I'm working on at the moment. Um, with an organization called Nutcut, and it's funded by the National Lottery. And it's, um, the intention is to kind of collect the oral histories of uh, descendants of indentured laborers from Fiji who came to the UK. Wow. And I think, yeah, yeah, and I, I think this is a really, this is a really rich and important time to be involved in the study of indentured. There's so many projects like this where we're saying we have so we have such little time left to speak to this generation about that's right. Yeah. 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 Right. Absolutely. And you know, it's interesting, you know, the point about the archives, because I think one thing that people will have gleaned from this already is you're into these alternative knowledges. And I use knowledges in the plural sense because we have here the academic, you know, institutionalized seals of approval as michael keith always says you know so the university stamp it's authentic and it's real yeah but what you're basically saying is there are holes in these things you know bullet holes is what you use which is what i like but the yeah. fact is i remember um at a conference where i can't remember if it was tina or who did it but people were looking at like cultural retentions in mm. places like guyana in places mm -hmm. like trinidad that you could locate yeah. right back to the, you know, the Indian. The yeah, yeah. And it's a bit like um, when people look at African retentions, you know, there are certain things. So if I say Nyami, which means Nyam food, but Ji Nyami in, in Akan languages is accept God. So we know that somewhere there's a link there. But yeah. again, you know, I find it fascinating. I find it fascinating that there was this alternative archive yeah. that you know scholars like yourselves use to say this is something that we do in trinidad or guyana or wherever and this is how it relates to you know the continent you know india before it was split into india and pakistan or whatever it is so i don't know can you give us a couple of examples of that maybe like because you're you're speaking yeah. to the archive but yeah give us a little bit more no, um, you know what, Professor Les, I think that we were both at that fantastic lecture that Tina Ramnarine gave last year, which was the Gafour oh, lecture. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. Do you remember she was talking about, um, she was talking, and this rum. is something- was something to do with rum and drinking was in there as well. She was talking about, she was talking about, she was talking about rum, because I remember we were, you were saying, you were saying, let's not all start saying whose rum is best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I know she's, she has this, um, uh, she has this fantastic approach that I love to kind of, because um, we, as, as scholars of indentured heritage, we have kind of challenged uh, white scholars who've used the word coolie in their work and and said i i understand why people in the indentured labor diaspora use it i'm not going to talk about its use in india because that is its use in india and that's a different yeah. Uh, yeah. that's different and it's not my my cultural experience but in the caribbean um we know it it, it is it can be a very offensive term and so you know when we're addressing the fact that white scholars are using it uh, academically we you know, and we have questioned that um and people have perhaps come back and said oh well it just means laborer which is i mean when a word has racial connotations in a place um it doesn't i mean obviously it doesn't just mean um in that space it doesn't just mean that of course not. and, and uh, i'm going to cut you yeah. but what white academics do and that's what yeah. white scholars do because what they think is if they can objectify it then they also objectify the experience of the people who are saying well actually no because when you, yeah. when you were talking about um, the different types of scholarship and how, you know, that wonderful scholar put the, whatever they were called, bookers on the periphery. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I did my AMB side metaphor, when I was trying to work out a structure for my thesis and I said to Les, you know, I don't want to just do oh, methodology, literature review. I don't want to do that. 
I said, I actually want to challenge the way how the black youth or the, no, the black experience has been framed and argued in the UK. So I wanted to use the A and the B side of a record. Right. So the A side is the, is the academic side. This is what you say about us. And it's generally very myopic, very monolithic because you have the power. You are the author, you have the power, you write people into reality. But if you think about the B side of a tune, it doesn't matter whether it's a reggae tune or a calypso tune or a ska tune, it doesn't matter. When you've got the instrumental, you have myriad performances on it. The A side is always restricted to this. This is the A side, this is the author. So if it's a sugar mine or chew, sing in Babylon, you mash up my life. That's what people will know that for. But when you flip the B-side over, Sugar Minot might come and DJ as Papa Honey and say, yeah, I like that girl over the road there, or pass me some more weed or whatever it is. So the, the B-side is where we can put our multiple stories on there. Yeah. And the thing is, we are the ones, we are the authors, we are the archive, we're that living embodiment of those histories. Yeah. And for me, this is what we do. We create and open that space. And that's what you're what you know you're yeah. suggesting in your work There's, who are these people yeah. to tell us what a coolie means i know what it means from when i grew up because yeah. we had coolie people living in our house but that was a descriptor mm -hmm. for indian people but as you get older you realize it's just, just as offensive as nigger of i course think it. so I, I think one of the most um i mean for me one of the most effective rebuttals of of um of kind of using that term was was by um was framed by um by tina when she was saying um when we use language like that we th and this goes back to that point about invisibility when we use language like that we stop we're not seeing people anymore no we're seeing units. It's a. It's just the return to colonialism. It's seeing. Um, it's not seeing individuals. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I think that. I think that, so. Like what she, coming just coming back to her lecture, what she has said before, is and what we know actually is documented. Um, is that all sorts of people indentured to come to um, to come to Guyana. Um, all sorts of people. So there was one year, for example, where there were complaints. It's documented in in um, um, in the untrustworthy archive because people were upset because it cost them because it cost them money. The <laughs> agricultural <laughs> labors have not been <laughs> agricultural labors have not been sent this year. Instead, we got a boat of jugglers, barbers, dancers, um, and um, it is everything that we cut. So you, um, when you talk about retention, you can see how things like that. Um, uh, you can you can see how um, you can see how colonialism kind of, kind of facilitated unwittingly facilitated the retention of traditions. Um, and I, I love um, I love the way that um, I love the way that Tina kind of uses that. That she because she resists also the use of the term indentured labor as well because she's saying a lot of people were not indentured laborers um so they may have indentured um but they were not that is their their life kind of before and after this moment um yes we, we're not they get reduced it. to that yeah yeah, yeah very reductive I, exactly exactly and um, I love the way that she she shows us that through music, doesn't she? You know, yeah. and um, and she walks us through uh, the reasons why her thesis is correct. <laughs> because look, we still have you know we still have all these musical traditions in the Caribbean. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've spoken about you know you've given us an insight into you know the experiences and the lived experiences, challenging that invisibility. invisibility across the Caribbean and many other places. But how do, you know, the descendants of those, you know, that, that Indian diaspora, that indentured labor force, how do they challenge that from within? So I'm speaking about, in a practical way about, you know, people like your father and yourself, because at first you said your father, you know, he kind of hid that from you to protect you from that history, that legacy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how has that been challenged from within? Yeah, I, I mean, this is such an interesting question to me, um, and I'll tell you why. Because my dad, for a long time, 
didn't, you know, he did. He thought he had nothing of use to give us. Um, and um, it's, you know, I've got. A, I wrote an essay recently about my my dad. It's it's coming out in September, um, and it's in a collection of writing by um, by women of. Um, women of the of the global Guyanese diaspora and Guyanese women living in Guyana, okay. and um, I wrote about my relationship with my um, with my dad, and I th especially kind of as a as a as a source that's led me to where I am now. And I there's there's a line in it where I'm reflecting on the first time he went back to Guyana since. 1961 so he'd left in 1961 wow. and when I was doing my PhD I wanted to do some research in the archive there and he wanted to come back with me um, so we went together in 2006 and I was reflecting on um, I was reflecting on the fact that so my, um, my dad when he left Guyana like many people of his generation leaving the Caribbean he would have had a lot of dreams for himself um, for his children and I, I don't think that he ever realized those dreams. And um, in terms of, um, in terms of leaving us anything of value, um, I don't think that he ever thought that his heritage was something of value to leave us. And that's my kind of my reflection in that, um, in that essay is kind of let us attach value to this heritage, let us treat it like it was gold, yeah. Um, because it is, you know, it, it is, and that it's, um, uh, you know, for me, like my my parents were not. My dad was a waiter, um, and he used to work at a lot of um, a lot of those kind of, you know, those clubs that you can imagine in colonial times were really kind of in um, Piccadilly and places like that. You can imagine they would have attracted the sort of people who um, who would have been working um, overseas in the colonies and were used to a certain, being treated a certain way. And I think instinctively having grown up in Guyana, he would have understood how those men behaved. Yes. Uh, and how they expected to be treated. And I think it was a shorthand for him. It was an easy thing for him to do just to switch off and uh, and turn yeah. on the things that they would have wanted to see. I think my parents had a, they had a really hard life. Um, and I think that um, what, uh, you know what he did raising five kids and the circumstances that he did in a country um, uh, which didn't accept his children as as British um, I I think that the most he didn't you know he didn't have um, he didn't have riches but I often think kind of if he had if only he had viewed and I understand completely why he didn't but if only he had viewed what he knew um, and and his roots as as valuable how how different life would have been so what you know what I think that this generation understands um which my father's generation didn't have the luxury of understanding because they were you right. know, yes absolutely it was a luxury yeah 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 um is is that you know um, this this inheritance our, our you know our inheritance is um, is our culture it's our it's our identity and it's so precious you know I feel so proud to be part of this diaspora um, because I think that they achieved and succeeded and thrived when everything was set against them doing so absolutely and that's something to be you know that's something to be incredibly proud of I think yeah. How did your father feel when you came, when he went over, when he went home after such a long period? How I mean, that was, feel? yeah, that was a really emotional journey for him. That was a really emotional journey for him. And I think also to see it, um, to see it um, with his kids. So um, can I say, you, you asked for one surprising thing at the end, but if I can, can I give it to you now? Because it's- Yeah, effective. absolutely, yeah. So um, one, so one surprising thing about me, perhaps um, people don't expect academics to have left school at a young age or to have been mature students. So I left school when I was fifteen, and I I didn't have you know I didn't have any qualifications. Um, and I think kind of my you know for my parents the fact that my brothers and I had not you know um, had not succeeded academically or not wanted to do anything academically was was really disappointing. Um, and I think for my dad, possibly especially me, because I was the only girl, 
and he felt that um, you know really really strongly and um, I think the fact of kind of going back to returning to education um, doing my first degree going on to do a master's and then do my do my PhD and choosing it to, to do it in something that was connected to um, to his roots although he always professed that that that's not you know oh you know why don't you study Shakespeare Shakespeare is something that should be studied not you know not adventure who cares about it's almost like he was saying it's almost like he was goading me in a way to do it you know I think it meant um I think it meant a lot to him to be um we you know what we stopped off at uh, in Trinidad um which was lovely we spent two or three days there and we were with my husband which was really I will never forget that time because my dad's quite ill now okay. um and he's on my mind um he's on my mind a lot and we were with my husband it was a it was just a you know it's just a beautiful trip I remember we were on the beach at Maracas and he said to me, you know, I never in my life imagined that, um, that someone in my family um, would do a PhD. And, uh, and I said, but because I mean, my, my, my dad's brothers and sisters have had kids who were not like us. We were quite wayward. <laughs> okay. And I, I said, but they're your family. He said, no, he said, no, my family, like my That's immediate right. I know family. exactly yeah. how he feels. Yeah. I know yeah. exactly how it feels. So I think it's it's really important that, you know, he's got to live to see that validation. And, and more importantly, it's manifest through your work. So yeah, I can just uh, yeah. imagine how he feels. Yeah, I love the, I, I mean, I love the idea that we've kind of come full, full circle to, um, you know, back to this point where, you know, where like, you know, can we now, this generation working on indenture, can we? And there are so many of us. So many. There's so many. Um, every like every month, I hear from somebody else who's working on indenture. I think this is fabulous. I feel like can we pick up this history, and uh, you know, can we can we give it back to our ancestors and say, you know, your lives are worth so much. Absolutely. You know, worth the value you never. You know, you may have never thought was attached to them, and it's kind of that uplifting of that. That uplifting, uplifting of our past, and it's—I don't know if you kind of like I. So I'm at an age now where I will, I have lost a few people um, to death, and I've had to do this thing where you pack somebody's life away after they've died. Yeah, too many. And, times. Yeah, too yeah. many. And um, Professor Les, does it not make you think about? Does it not make you think about what you leave behind and what you want to leave behind? And yeah. I think. And that's you know that's what I think now. My parents. So my mom died last year. My mother in law. My mother in law died last year. And it's, it's just that. both. Yeah, I experienced that four yeah. years ago. My mum, and then a year after, I think it was a year and a bit after, my second mum, who was my mother in law. So peace be upon them. Yeah, but but yeah. yeah. Sorry, Kevin. Yeah, and you just you just kind of you're looking at what's left because sometimes the bureaucracy is hard. You know, calling the bank and telling utility company this person passed away, and and uh, in it you kind of look at what what is left behind and what is on paper um, or um, money in the bank or any little trinket. Um, it does in the long game. It does not matter. It does not matter. But what um, you know, this history that people have, the stories of who they were, how they lived, what they did, how they treated other people, how other people treated them, what they left in the earth in terms of their, you know, their spirit, their energy. Yeah. This is that is a legacy, and I kind of I am a product of um, a community. So that the history of Clement Cicheran, he refers to kind of like a um a collective amnesia amongst um yeah. amongst indentured Indians in the Caribbean, which I um, I understand that completely. This idea we're not gonna speak about India and uh, we're not gonna speak about where we came from. We'll refer to it in a particular way at particular times and, and this is what we agree as a community. Well the effects of that um can be seen can be seen to be tragic in um, you know in in some generations and certainly in my family it has been you know it's this idea that um, uh, we had an identity that really nobody spoke about and I hoped I kind of hope that what I am doing is involving myself in a process of recovering that identity and saying you know this this is an inheritance it is real it is tangible and it is valuable we should all look at it. Yeah, absolutely, um, and it's what you do. 
And and for me, you hit the nail on the head. You know, I was speaking to um, somebody again the other day. I can't remember who on one of these out of views, and they said, you know, that's what it means to be immortal. To be immortal means you leave something of value yeah. behind. Yeah. And that's why for me, it's always document, discuss, disseminate. Yeah. So whether it was through my music and my lyrics, you know, when I used to chat on sound system or, you know, I write my stuff, mm -hmm. you know, as you know, I write articles, I write chapters, but if I put books towards publishers, then I want them. I self-publish because as far as I'm concerned, if one person reads my book and says, oh yeah, I can get with that, it's good yeah. enough. Because as Chronics, one of my favorite Jamaican singers says, we do it for the love, not the likes. Yes. Yeah. And when we're gone, you know, this is what you're doing. You're creating that archive for people who will say, yes, my great, great grandfather was from India or my great, great grandmother was from India. And there's this massive disconnect. However, there are these people and there's a body of scholarship that is bridging that gap, but not bridging it in an academic, you know, highfalutin scholarly way that no one understands what the hell you're talking about. Here are some aspects of the cultural retentions this is the origins of those and this is how they've kind of morphed into our way of life mm. in the caribbean or or wherever these other wonderful places and but i think you know the beautiful thing for me that has come out today is this is this movement of indentured peoples i think that is amazing because the commonality is colonization and displacement, yeah. dispersal, yeah. diaspora. Yeah. I think it's wonderful to add that body of knowledge to these discussions. Yeah, yeah. No, it's and it's an incredible amazing. thing that these people scattered all over the world have kind of like come are coming together, you know, continually in in um, um, in these ways of creating anthologies of. Um, yeah. I think of it, I, I just think it's different. wonderful. Right. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. Once you recognise the commonality of your condition, you realise that people try to make us think that there, there are these stark and distinct differences based on race, gender, complexion, you name it, whatever ism they want to use. But at the end of the day, you can look at this person's... That's why I, I love the thing that you said, um, tied to the tide, or was that what it was? It? Yeah. yeah, tied to the oh, tide. I yeah. love that. Yeah. I just wish I'd come up with that and put it in a lyric because it just makes sense because tides ebb and flow. Yeah. People ebb and flow. Yeah. Experiences ebb and flows. History is not linear. It's yeah. ebb and flows because it can inform us and we can use it to predict. So, Sis Maria, um, have you got a takeaway for us? If, um, if my takeaway could be an article, if that's okay, um, take away is your takeaway. Yeah, I'd love that it. Sounds to... like, that sounds like a main meal. <laughs> we'll say it's a takeaway. Yeah. I'd love it to be an article I wrote for the British Library a couple of years ago. And it's called Hidden Histories, Indenture to Windrush. Um, Indenture to Google... Windrush. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's about, it's kind of about, it's a story about descendants of indenture um, uh, who are also part of Generation Windrush. And um, it just the, the, it's just the kind of an attempt to give a little bit of information about who that community were and um, yeah. and uh, leave, leave a little bit of a footprint for them there. Yeah, well, absolutely. Again, combating yeah. that invisibility and presenting an archive. It's there absolutely. and people can access it. Well, Dr. Maria, what can I say? You know, I really give thanks that you've joined me today on the Out of You Where Reason Comes First. And I know people definitely get a lot from this because as I said, this history is hidden and it's invisible and yet it's ever present. You cannot go to the Car you cannot go to the Caribbean and not see, and I like the term you used, that footprint, but who left the footprint? Yeah. That's the hidden aspect, that's the hidden dimension. So I really give thanks for you joining me today. No, thank you. Thanks so much for asking me. It's always, it is always a pleasure um, to see you and to talk to you. So thanks so much for inviting me on.
is a term I use to describe my mother. In this world, you know I love that woman like no other woman. The island's a lyric of no, cause from the sea.